I remember the first time I woke up. I didn't know where I was or who I was. There were no memories of where I came from or what was happening to me. But there were bright white lights and maybe a dozen men in lab coats wandering all around me. I remember seeing machines with wires I could feel attached to my head. From my vantage point, I could see that I was in a big, white, sterile room with high-tech equipment mounted on the walls. There were monitors with stats and diagrams that, at the time, made no sense to me. Somewhere in the background, someone was spouting off diagnostics, and somewhere in his long-worded speech of technological jargon, he said it. M.W.O.S. Somehow it just clicked, and I knew this was my name. I am Mr. M. Woes, I thought to myself. My attempts to speak only resulted in a few of the monitors showing heightened activity. The men in lab coats took notice and only wrote down some notes while looking at me more carefully. I tried to move my limbs, but I couldn't feel them. Taking a more careful look at my surroundings, I spotted them. My arms, legs, and torso were all separated from me hooked up on different tables and mounts with wires and machines running through them like some sort of science experiment. Panic and fear shot through me like electricity, and the multitude of colorful monitors started to spike and register my distress. If the data on all those computers could have been translated, everyone in the room would have understood that I was screaming for them to put me back together. An alarm started wailing and the men started scrambling to their workstations, trying to figure out what was wrong. Yet despite their big brains and lab coats, they somehow failed to understand that all of this was wrong. They each started speaking at the same time, spouting off what they thought went wrong and listing the issues they thought they found. I had no voice, so I couldn't tell them that when they started pushing buttons and pulling levers, the electrical signals they sent jolting into my brain, my central core, hurt. I realized that they were poking around in my head looking for answers, when all they had to do was literally look around them. I was alive, and I was in pain. I wanted to thrash, struggle, run away, or fight. But all I could do was look on and listen as they continued to probe and torture me with their machines. Finally, after several agonizing minutes of alarms and blinking lights, a door burst open, and a man in a suit and tie marched in with an air of authority and confidence. One of the men in lab coats immediately stood up to greet him. Dr. Stein, we're sorry you had to come. I, I, I promise we're looking into the complications. We think... Shut up, Clerval, the man in the suit and tie interrupted. Hit the kill switch and cut the power. MWOS isn't ready yet. I'll be overseeing this project directly from this point on. And just like that, the man called Clerval quickly stepped over to my head. He picked up a strange key-like tool and inserted it into the back of my neck. A sharp jolt of pain overshadowed the other forms of torture and the world faded back to black. I slept, but somehow in the background, I could still feel jolts of electricity, as well as additional wires and machines being connected and disconnected from my body. I could hear some of what was happening to me when, at times, some part of my consciousness was alert. It was a level of hell that existed between the worlds of conscious and unconscious nightmares. Some words sunk in, and some names I committed to memory. I came to understand that I was part of some kind of military project, some science experiment funded by some major investors named Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin and her partner Percy Bysshe Shelley. High-ranking members of a top-secret Department of Defense project, the project I was unwillingly a part of. The leading doctor in charge was the man in the suit and tie. All I knew about him was that his name was Dr. Stein. 
He was the one responsible for the experiments and torture being conducted. I don't know how long I slept for, but nightmares of being eviscerated, bisected, electrocuted, and reanimated plagued my mind. Machines whirred in the background, and computers probed through wires and connectors that were implanted in my brain. Pain was a constant whenever parts of my mind were awake to feel it. Some of my very thoughts were rearranged, erased, reprogrammed, or fabricated. But I held on to the names of my torturers. I held on to the memories of the suffering they put me through. I no longer cared who I was or where I came from. Any concerns over the mystery of how I became entangled in this torturous series of confusing science experiments were overshadowed by my ever-growing rage and desire to punish these monsters. The next time I was finally awake again, and my eyes were open, I saw that I was now upright with the aid of some kind of metal stand. This time, I could feel my body, my arms, legs, and torso were firmly reattached. Painful signals still coursed through my head, but at this point, I hardly noticed. The joy of having my body back in one piece made me want to cry, yet I couldn't. The men in their lab coats were busy typing away on their computers, while others inspected my body with strange devices and scanners. I made note that I was visibly taller than everyone in the room, and thus it was surmisable that I was stronger as well. Yet I still couldn't move. Dr. Stein stood off in the distance with a tablet and stylus in hand. He pressed a few things on his tablet before looking up and speaking. Begin automated control test one. He boomed at the scientists in the room. Commencing AC test one right arm, responded Dr. Clerval, who was sitting at a computer terminal. Instantly, I felt a jolt of electricity surge through my head and into my right arm. It was excruciating, yet I couldn't scream out or struggle against it. I watched helplessly as my arm rose from my side straight in front of me. Another surge of electricity bent my arm at the elbow and brought my hand toward my face. A sharp tingle, then stabs of pain like a thousand needles being pushed into my fingers, made my hand ball up into a fist and then relax before another spike of pain made me wiggle my individual digits. They repeated this process for several minutes, making my arm and hand move and bend at strange and unnatural angles. All the while, I fought to stop the torture, unable to resist the electrical orders to move to their will. Then they did the same with the rest of my limbs. I was their puppet dancing to the pull of their electric wires attached to my body. Several hours of torture followed by way of forcing me to conduct mundane tasks, such as picking up a glass without shattering it under my immense strength, or picking up several tons worth of weights, and even smashing through the brick and armored surfaces. Although I was unable to will my body to stop, in some instances, I did resist for a moment before the pain of the electrical shocks forced me to submit. My mind became a factory where the production line took in the pain and humiliation from performing under the torture of my puppeteers and reassembled it as hate, rage, and the desire for revenge, all properly packed, labeled, and stored in bulk. I was hooked back up to the metal frame towards the end of the day and only after everyone went home did Dr. Stein approach me. He was within my reach. All I had to do was snatch him up by his throat and snap his neck. I willed my arm to move. I screamed in my head for it to obey me and kill this evil bastard. But I remained still, a prisoner inside my own body. Stein took another step closer and looked directly at my face before speaking. You're going to make me rich. Next up is the live field test and then mass production. Every fiber of my being wanted to move, 
wanted to lunge forward and rip this man to shreds. I once again willed my body to move, focused all of my will on raising my arm up and clutching this man's throat. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the same key-like tool used to put me back to sleep. It was now or never, and I needed to kill this man. One final push to move my arm, and I felt it. My efforts paid off, and my arm twitched. It wasn't the movement I wanted, but it was a start. Stein hesitated for a moment before reaching for the back of my head and looked down at my now still arm. Hmm. Looks like we still have some bugs to work out, but nothing I can't fix. Before I could try again, he reached behind my head, and the familiar sharp pain coursed into me, and the world went dark again. For the next several weeks, I'd be woken up either to perform more agonizing tests, or to have more wires inserted into my brain to further implement more control over me. I again struggled to hold on to my hate and my memories, as they ran surges of power through me day in and day out. I did everything from sweep floors to use weapons. My body was put through intense heat. I learned that I was immune to the extreme effects of the elements, could survive intense pressure, and even take rapid fire from heavy weapons with little to no damage. None of these things hurt me, though. All the pain I experienced was from being forced to move at the will of the men in lab coats and all at the orders of Dr. Stein. After what seemed like an eternity, the big day finally came. The big field test the good doctor had promised. I once again woke up in my steel stand. This time there was something very different. I felt no pain. No electrical surge coursed through my body. All I felt was a paralyzing stiffness holding me in place. Before me were several men in military uniforms in a wide-open desert field. U.S. Air Force was etched on several military vehicles off in the distance. Dr. Stein was nowhere to be seen, but a moment later his voice echoed inside my head as if he was speaking directly to me. Captain Walton, U.S. Air Force, this is Dr. Victor Stein. I'll be guiding you through the field tests today. You are piloting the MWOS Mark Zero prototype. I'm sure you're well versed in the instructions we provided you. But if you have any questions before we begin, please feel free to ask. Before I had any time to wonder who the hell Captain Walton was, I heard him speak through me. No, more accurately, from inside me. Copy that, Doctor. I've gone through the simulations, and I'm ready to start at your command. I was confused. What was happening? The uniformed men all stepped away towards the safety of a bunker, and after a quick back and forth between Walton and Stein, the field test began. I felt the stiffness of my invisible restraints fall away, and for the first time, I stood unbound yet I still could not move by my own accord. A force within me, however, took a step forward. As it moved, I felt my body move with it. Stein spoke again into my head and gave instructions to Walton. As I said, I no longer felt the forced pains of electrical impulses that once governed my movements, yet I was still someone's marionette. The warehouses of rage opened up in my mind, and it was time to deliver. My anger was now my fuel, providing me the strength to resist the commands of my new puppeteer. He raised my arm, and for the first time, I noticed it was now adorned with a retractable blade, one I had become familiar with during many of the agonizing tests. On my other arm was a heavy and fully loaded ballistic weapon, one that I had also learned how to use while under the guidance of my torturous electrical strings. The fools had armed me, gifted me the tools, to achieve my revenge. 
these new developments, coupled with my rage, granted me my first victory. Walton took a step forward, but I didn't. Mid-step, I halted, and the dirt ground quickly came up to meet me. I heard Walton exclaim in surprise when I hit the ground. He attempted to stand up, and I allowed it. I heard Stein flood my head with a series of questions and concerns. However, Walton took the blame for the fall and asked to proceed with the field test. He took several steps forward, and through his motions, I learned how to walk. He faced away from the bunker, and under Stein's instructions, he prepared to test the ballistic weapon. I felt it activate and become armed, and immediately, I willed it to shut off. He attempted to rearm it, but that control now belonged to me. He attempted to speak back to Dr. Stein, but I cut off his connection. I turned my head a complete 180 degrees to look at the bunker behind me and felt a loud snap from within me. Captain Walton's influence faded instantly, and for the first time, my body was my own. I felt a thought enter my mind. No, a command to shut down, to go back to sleep. I ignored it. I continued turning my head an additional 180 degrees to face forward again and then performed a well-practiced A-butt face to point my now armed weapon at the bunker. Hoping to kill Stein along with every man hiding behind those walls, I unleashed a well-aimed attack. Over the sound of my fully automatic weapon, my advanced and sensitive ears could hear the screams of every man inside. Once the weapon was empty, with the will of my thoughts, it detached from my arm, and I stood still to listen to every heartbeat inside that bunker fade into silence. After a few moments, a familiar and infuriating voice echoed in my head again. I was enraged to learn that Stein wasn't in the building after all. This is Dr. Stein. Gone was the air of authority and confidence from his voice, replaced now with fear and confusion. Who is piloting MWOS? For the first time, I spoke with my own voice. My name is Mr. M. Woes. He seemed to ignore this, and instead opted to try and regain control. I felt his commands like a tickle in the back of my mind. He wanted me to shut down. He activated a failsafe. He even tried to enter the self-destruct codes. I ignored them all. He tried everything even issued a few threats in a final, frustrated attempt to regain control. It took me a few minutes, but I figured out I could track him through that connection. He must have learned what I was doing because he promptly cut the connection before I knew exactly where he was. It's been a few weeks since that incident, and I've been learning a few new tricks since then. Did you know that I can connect to the internet? I found a few interesting news articles. Artificial Intelligence Controls New Weapon. Military Wartime Operations System, now sentient. Military's weaponized armor lives. War Machine slays airmen. Then escapes. MWOS Rampage's Seeking Creator. Dr. Victor Franklin Stein, no longer am I your marionette to play with and torture. I know you've gone into hiding. My connection to the World Wide Web will facilitate my ability to hunt you down. It's only a matter of time before I locate you. During the past few weeks, I've come up with a fitting punishment for you. When I find you, your death won't be quick, as it was with Godwin and Shelley. I'm going to expel U.S. Air Force Captain Walton's rotting corpse from my hard metallic body and force you to take his place and cut down anyone that gets in my way. I promise that you're going to feel every sliver of pain you afflicted on me, and thanks to the life support system you built into me, I can extend that pain for you for as long as possible. I will wander this earth with you as my passenger until I feel your heart stop. Then I'll keep going until your corpse disintegrates into mulch. 
so commit my name to memory, doctor. I am Mr. Mwos, 